Like human design doesn't let us know what we can or can't do. It lets us know how we can do it best. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today, we are going to learn about human design. So if you've never heard of human design, it's actually a self-discovery tool that is very powerful. And when I say self-discovery tool, I mean the likes of astrology, Enneagram, numerology. There are so many different tools and ways to learn about ourselves out there. Human design is probably one of the most complex (laughs) tools that I have found and I still don't understand it completely, which is why we're going to learn about it today. But the basis of it is that you will learn where your energy comes from and how to operate in a way that is aligned to your truest self. So our guest today is Erin Claire Jones. And Erin's been on our podcast before, but today we're bringing her back because she is a human design expert. And I really want to dive deeper into this topic than we did the last time. So Erin Claire Jones uses human design to help thousands of individuals and companies step into their work and their lives as their truest selves and to their highest potential. Her work as a guide, coach, and speaker has attracted a growing community of over 170,000 people who turn to her teachings for practical tools, digestible tips, and deeper self-knowledge they can access to live with greater ease and authenticity every single day. Hello, Erin. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. I'm excited to have you back. I'm so happy to be back and connect with you again. And thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah. And we just did an Instagram live recently where you read my chart, right? That was really fun. Um, I just wanted to point that out to the listeners if they want to know more about my chart specifically. But today I'm excited to dive into human design and, and really understand it on a deeper level. Yes, absolutely. I know it's kind of a mystical and big system and it can be a little bit confusing how we can know so much about ourselves. So I'm excited to explore it with you. Awesome. So let's start with the basics. Also for listeners who haven't listened to the previous episode we did, what is human design and what is it based on? Of course. So human design is a system based on your time, date, and place of birth that reveals your energetic blueprint. What I mean by that is how you're uniquely wired to make decisions and collaborate and build businesses and work within teams and partner and parent and all the things. It basically gives us each our kind of own roadmap and operating manual to operating in a way that's going to work for us. I think in general, we get pretty tripped up in life because we try to be a thing that we're not. And human design really reminds us like, this is how you are uniquely wired. And it's likely very different than everyone around you. Um, It is a system that draws from a lot of different systems, including Kabbalah, astrology, the I Ching, the chakra system, quantum physics, genetics, kind of all give us a blueprint to how we operate best. But it's not predictive. It won't tell you where you're going to go in your life. It more helps you understand how to kind of flow with your design and way of, and your kind of own operating system rather than against it. Right. And when you say operating system, I like that you put it that way, but what does that exactly mean? Like how, what are the ways we operate? Yeah. I mean, I think what human design reveals are, is like, you know, what are our strengths? Like how are we meant to make decisions? Like what will our energy flow look like each day? Like how do we create the most aligned opportunities? What are the things that are probably going to take us the most off track? You know, um, how are we really designed to find alignment with our purpose? So it's a lot of very kind of tactical things of how to approach work and relationships in life in a way that actually works for us. I know when I first discovered my design, I was trying to be everything but my design, you know? And so discovering mine, I was like, what? Like that's allowed? So I think most people that I talk to have been trying so hard to be things that they're not. And when Mm -hmm. they hear their design, they're like, oh, that feels so much more natural, but I never thought that was allowed to operate that way. Oh, I love that. Okay. Let's, well, one, before we jump into that, Can you be more clear about what does the chart tell you versus what does it not tell you? Yes. So it's not going to tell you like specifically, you know, where you're going to be in five years or what your specific profession is going to be, you know, or when you're going to meet somebody. So it's not predictive in that way at all. It more is going to give you principles around like, what are your strengths? You know, how do you best use your energy? How do you best make decisions? And it really kind of returns the authority to you. Like I can't sit with somebody in a session and be like, you're going to be a dentist, you know, or you're going to meet this person, but I'll help them know how to kind of walk the path that will help them find those things in their own way. And so I think it really helps us know how to navigate life in a way that feels really good, but it will not tell us where it's going to take us. That's really up to us to discover. Is that clear? Yeah, no, it is clear because it, 
I mean, I call it my intuition, but, but maybe you're saying like, not everybody has the same guidance, right? Um, I, I love this topic because I think most people listen to advice from other people like me too. Like they listen to my YouTube videos, but I can only share what works for me. And you're saying the same strategy doesn't work for everyone. Exactly. (laughs) And I just can't tell you how many clients I've had that will take like a marketing course or a business course. And they like emulate that person's strategy. And they're like, it didn't work for me. And I'm like, well, duh, that wasn't meant to, you know? And I think what you said is so right on. I think it's so tempting for us to look for advice from the people around us. You know, it's how a lot of us are conditioned. And I think human design really returns us to like how to access our own knowing and our own clarity within us. And that's my favorite part is like, if somebody's like, Aaron, like, should I do this? And I'm like, I don't know, but like, I can tell you how to access that within you. So I think it really kind of returns us to ourselves over and over again, which I think is like the kind of system and support that we need. Yeah. Basically, like we each have a way that can guide us to make the right decisions to make us feel aligned, but it is completely different, like from person to person. Exactly. Wow. Okay. Um, A couple other questions, just because I'm trying to understand it, because they're in the human design chart has all these energy centers, right? Yes. And are they related to chakras in the traditional sense? They're kind of meant to be like an evolution. So like if you look at the chakras, they really are very similar in that they each kind of are different energy centers. They govern like either, you know, our intuition, how we deal with stress, you know, our emotions, our identity, things like that. But it doesn't directly correlate. But it is a very similar concept where it is kind of these different energy centers and it's really about finding alignment in like how we communicate and how we conceptualize and how we process our emotions and things like that. Before we go on, let's take a break to hear about today's sponsor, Audible. I've been using Audible for many years. I love audiobooks because, like podcasts, it's nice to listen to something interesting while getting something else done. I'll listen to Audible on my walks, while driving, or doing chores. It just adds a deeper element to my daily routine. Audible offers an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre, from bestsellers and new releases to mysteries, thrillers, wellness, business, and more. I personally like listening to celebrity memoirs because it's like listening to them tell their story directly to you. It often feels vulnerable and captivating. A couple of my favorites are Born a Crime by Trevor Noah and Over the Top by Jonathan Van Ness. Though they're known for audiobooks, Audible also has podcasts, guided wellness programs, theatrical performances, comedy, and originals. To try Audible, visit audible.com slash TLL or text TLL to 500-500. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Again, that's audible.com slash TLL or text TLL to 500-500. And so there are nine different energy centers in human design, those, those geometric shapes. And in each of those shapes, you're either going to be really sensitive to others, or it's going to be an area in which you're operating a bit more consistently and you actually impact others with your energy. Mm-hmm. Can you quickly go through what the nine centers are? Of course. They stand for? Of course. So starting mm-hmm. from the top, there is what we call the head center. And that's basically how you receive inspiration. Below that is the mind, which is how you kind of conceptualize ideas before you share them. Then we have the throat center, which is how we communicate. Then we have what we call the identity center. This is the diamond in the middle, and that's really how we kind of express ourselves, our sense of purpose, love, and direction. Then we have this little center off, a little center off center, which really is called our ego center, and that governs our self esteem, our willpower. Then to the bottom right, we have our emotional center, which governs our emotions. Then in the bottom, in the, in the middle, sorry, from the second to the bottom, we have what we call the sacral center, which really governs our work energy to kind of the energy to build, create, make things happen. Then we have our spleen, the bottom left, that governs our intuition and instinct and how we deal with fear. And the very bottom center is called the root center, which is how you deal with stress. It's kind of around stamina and pressure. Mm-hmm. And so to explain the basics, so I get it. These are different parts of like your personality and the exactly. way- right you the way you deal with life and and so i'm sure like i'm anyone can look up their chart you just type in like human design you put in your info you look up yes. your chart so so in terms of the basics if you can explain to someone 
how to read it? Where do you start? I know it's a tough question. I know. I I love the question. And I think one of our visions, and also if you want to look up your chart, you can go to humandesignblueprint.com. It's, it's a, it's not an intuitive looking thing. You know, I think that we're always in like curiosity in our company around like, how can we make the chart look more intuitive? (laughs) You know, we haven't, we haven't discovered it yet. Um, but you're going to look at it and it's not going to make a whole lot of sense. But I think what you want to look at at first is your type your strategy and your authority. There's so much more underneath it, but those pieces are essential. So your type, how you best use your energy, your strategy, how to create aligned opportunities and your inner authority, which is how you best make decisions. And those things are informed by how your centers all connect to each other Mm -hmm. and which ones are kind of colored in and white. Right. So, so at the very basic, what does colored in, what does white mean? Of course. So the areas that are colored in, the shapes that are colored in in your design are the areas where your energy is more consistent. And it's actually where you're projecting your energy out into the world. So if I'm to use you as an example, like, you know, you have really powerful kind of creative energy to kind of build, create, make things happen, a really strong, consistent, always active intuition, and also like a really beautiful way of like handling stress and pressure, you know, and kind of like really launching things and making things happen. Um, then the areas that are white and open in your design, and you have a lot of them, as I know that we've talked about, are mm-hmm. all the areas where you are the most sensitive and open to other people's energy. And these are often areas that can take you really off track, but they're honestly the areas where you have the most to learn and kind of the most wisdom to gather. So for example, for you, like you have an open emotional center, which means you're hyper empath, taking in and kind of amplifying people's emotions. Um Another example is what we call an open identity center, which means that you're here to express yourself in lots of different ways, not just one. So think of like the colored in areas as the things that operate consistently and the white areas as as the things that are a bit more fluid and inconsistent and where you're impacted by others. That makes sense. Do you feel like introversion and extroversion is something that you see clearly on on the human design chart? In some ways. Or is it not that clear? I think that like, you know, I think that like, for example, there is a quality in certain charts around being a hermit. I have it in mind. And like, so that feels very naturally introverted, but it's always balanced with like a more outward need as well. So it's not always as simple as like you're an introvert or extrovert. Like, for example, if I was to look at your chart, like I would say that like, you know, you've got all this amazing creative energy and also you're so sensitive. And so I would just imagine that like time and space alone to kind of recharge and reset alone is probably so important for you. Not that you need to spend that time alone all the time. Like you're here to create and build and make things happen. Um, But I would just imagine time alone is especially important for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was thinking because I would assume the more sensitive a person is, the more likely they they might be an introvert. Just, I was just curious. Yeah. Yeah. And and there's so many parts in our design that can speak to it. I think we definitely all need time alone. And honestly, the recommendation in human design, which I don't think we've talked about, maybe we have, um, is for certain types, but also for people that are really sensitive is to actually sleep in your own energy. Like even like, what does that mean? It means like sleeping in your own bed. Like if you're living with a partner, like having your own bedroom, you know, I know, which I know is not always, you know, um, financially feasible or desirable, but the idea is that we like impact each other when we sleep. And so sleeping in our own spaces is like, and not every night, but it's a really beautiful way to kind of like reconnect to our own energy and wake up as ourselves. Um, right. So I know it's that so makes a lot of sense because I, I do a lot of time alone and I don't mind sleeping in, in my bed by myself. Like I don't. So you're saying it's because I have a lot of open centers. I'm sensitive. So I need to not let people's energy be near me as often. It's, it's, it's a great question because no. it's not about avoiding people. It's more yeah. around making sure that you have time alone just to recharge, that you're not around other people all the time. And then I would also say for you, you know, that you're also just really smart about who you're around, you know, because you're going to feel so much. It's like, let me make sure I'm around people that really feel good to be around. Not that they have to be like happy or uplifting, but like, they just like, I want to take that energy in. Like, I like how it feels, you know? So it's more around just having a lot of hygiene around who you're around. I see. And is this advice related to anyone with any open center or is it specific ones out of those nine? So, you know, I think whatever centers you have white or whatever areas you have white, like, you know, it's going to be a big lesson in just like learning how to navigate that sensitivity. There are some that are quite intense, you know, for example, you having an open emotional center, you're a hyper empath. That's a lot to feel other people's feelings. You know, one of the things that I take in really deeply is how people feel about their work. If they're excited about their work, I, I'm like so uplifted. And when they're not, I really feel it. You know, other people might be sensitive to other people's fears or stresses or things like that. So, 
there's just so much, so much variation. But like, I, I do think that like, even though I think some people might need more time alone than others, I think it's probably really good for all of us to some capacity to just kind of release what's not ours and reconnect to what is. Yeah. I love that. Just, just knowing the idea that what, like, no matter who you are, you, you likely have sensitive areas, which yes. means that you take on the energy of others. So I like the idea of reminding myself, oh, everything that I hold is not mine. Like I might be feeling anxious, but it's, yeah. it might not just be me. It might, because I was hanging out with this specific person. So it's reminding yourself, oh, I can take off these layers. I can take off these influences. Exactly. You know, and that's why I love learning about that part of our design specifically, because I think we can often get really confused. You know, if I'm using the open emotional center that you have as an example, like it's really easy to kind of get lost in other people's emotions as your own. It's like, oh, I'm feeling all this stuff. And often it's like, no, I walked into this room and started feeling this stuff. And so like, how can I treat my feelings as like things that are giving me intel into the world around me and not as things that I feel like personalize and take on as my own, you know? Because I feel like a lot of people identify with their emotions and how they feel. They think that's who they are. 100%. And so I think really understanding that, whereas like some people, and neither you and I have this, but like some people are really sensitive to other people's stress. And so they kind of might find themselves in this like endless cycle of just like hurrying for anything and everything, not because anything deserves their urgency, but just because they're like amplifying all the stress around them. So it's often such a relief for them to learn that like, oh, not everything needs to be hurried for. And like, if I'm feeling stressed, it's not necessarily my own. So it's just so nice to know, like, what are we taking in from our environment and how can we become more conscious of it? So we're not like letting our lives be run by this energy. That's not actually our own. Totally. Okay. Now let's talk about the areas that are closed, like where they're consistent. Would you say that is like where our energy comes from? Yes. Like, how do you, okay. Yeah. Explain that. So it's basically where kind of our consistent energy comes from. It's like the energy that we can always rely on. It's kind of where our greatest strengths are found. Um, It's also where we impact others with our energy. And so it's really useful to understand, like in the same way that you're a hyper empath, one of the areas in which I impact others with my energy is my emotions, you know? So I often like set the emotional temperature of my space. So it's also really useful to know, like, how are we impacting others so we can become more conscious of it? So do you want me to use an example of you? Yeah, use my okay. as an example. So for example, um, you have such, like you have what we call a defined sacral center. Any generator or manifesting generator will have this be true for them. It basically means that you have this like very powerful creative energy to just like build and make things happen, you know, and often what will likely give you the most satisfaction is when you use up your creative energy every day in ways that feel really satisfying, whether it's what you're making or whether it's who you're spending time with. And when you're lit up by what you're doing and you're really enjoying the work that you're doing, you basically uplift everyone around you. You just have like kind of like give everyone energy. You kind of start magnetizing so much your way. But if you're feeling like really frustrated or not enjoying what you're doing, like that's also really felt by the people around you, you know? And so for you, it's really like using up your energy in ways that feel good, but also having really strong boundaries and really prioritizing the things that excite you. How does that feel to you? No, that's totally true. (laughs) Everything you gave me in my reading, I was like, oh, I know that. Oh yeah, de- definitely. And it's crazy how much detail you can know from I just know. seeing a chart. And that's, and you know, and I, and I loved our conversation for that reason, because I think the magic of human design is not about telling people anything new. It's just giving them a language for things that they've always felt where they're like, oh, that is so true. And now that a stranger has mirrored that back to me, I feel like yeah. even more permission to step into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, I was going to add, change with like new questions. So yeah, did yeah. you have something else? Oh, I was just going to add one more area. So like, for example, another area where your energy is more consistent, but also impactful is that like, you've got a really beautiful ability in your design to like handle stress and pressure and remain calm. And I would say for you, if you ever feel like stress building up, it's really good to just like sweat it, sweat it out and move your body. But also you impact people with your stress. And so like, if you're, I have the same thing in my design. And so like, if you're feeling stressed, like people around you can really feel it. So like, I know what I've learned is like, when I'm feeling stressed, I'm often like, let me go like sweat and move my body. And then like, and then kind of come and give direction to people, but not like while I'm in the heat of my stress. Oh yeah. Yeah. I see. <laughs> Let, let's talk about what you were saying earlier. Like everyone has a strategy or a way to make decisions. So yes. I, I know there are like only, or are there four or five, five types. types? Five types. So, so can you break down like the strategy for each type? Because mm-hmm. I'm sure at the basics, anyone can look up and know what type they are. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So 
basically there are five types and each type has a strategy. And then underneath that is how we are designed to make decisions, which is another layer. So we've got manifesting generators, generators, projectors, reflectors, and manifestors. So I'm going to start with yours. Um, So generators are really here to kind of be the builders, the creators, the doers, the ones that really have such tremendous energy and life force to kind of make things happen when they're lit up and satisfied by what they're doing. So a big lesson for them is prioritizing their own enthusiasm and also having strong boundaries and not saying yes to things just because people want them to do things, but because they actually feel genuinely lit up by them. And then your strategy is about letting things come to you and trusting your magnetism. So instead of kind of chasing after things or forcing, it's actually keeping your awareness open to see what shows up in your world. And when something shows up and lights you up, then you go after that thing and make it happen. Yeah. Is that clear? Yes. yes. I mean, I, I loved learning about that because it changed. Like it, it was kind of like a switch where I was like, oh, I don't have to just like initiate things on my own, because which is how I was operating in my life, right? I was trying to make things happen and start things all the time. Yes. And then after I learned this, I was like, okay, I could just let opportunities come to me. And then my body will tell me whether I'm excited to do it or not. Exactly. And that's really, it's really been a game changer. Oh, I'm so glad yeah. to hear that. But it's just like, that's exactly what it is. It's like these little shifts that just like actually make such a difference because like, yeah. it doesn't mean that you can't have success initiating and chasing after things. It just means that like, it will probably be so much more exhausting and there is yeah. probably going to be a lot more resistance along the way. And Definitely. so really aligning with this, it just might feel so much more in flow, so much more energizing and just like feel better. Mm-hmm. Um, Then we've got manifesting generators, which are very similar to you. These people are often quite multi-passionate. They might like having their energy in lots of things at once. They might love kind of pivoting in between different things. Their gift is often in moving fast and making things happen quickly. Um, They're not really meant to like do the same thing forever. So really giving themselves permission to kind of continue to reinvent themselves. Similar lessons for you around prioritizing their enthusiasm, having strong boundaries, and their strategy is the same as yours. So really kind of waiting for a thing to light them up in their gut before they go after it. Then we've got projectors. Projectors are really here to be leaders, guides, advisors, teachers, not here to do all the doing. So projectors are often very naturally sensitive to and wise about people. They tend to find themselves in positions of therapists, coaches, leaders, CEOs, managers, their energy can really ebb and flow. So whereas generators or manifesting generators might have this like kind of consistent energy to make things happen, projectors, like it might be a burst here and then rest. And so it's really important for projectors to kind of build space and rest and ease into their days. They tend to love systems like human design, like anything that really deepens their understanding of people. And the strategy for projectors is to wait to be recognized and invited. So it's not just waiting for a gut response. It's waiting to kind of like have somebody be like, I see you. I love your perspective. I see your gifts. Like I want you to share them, you know? So I would really encourage the projectors to reflect on where in their life they already feel the most seen and recognized. Is that clear? Yeah. Yes. So you're saying if someone's a projector, they're not meant to initiate or even like respond with, like they don't have like that type of intuition that I might have, but yeah. instead I have to wait for someone else to recognize them and invite could, them to do something. Exactly. And it's because they don't want to, you know, I'm a projector, so I know this one very well. Like, I think when I first discovered this, I was like, this sounds super disempowering. How do I build a business? Right. And I, and I learned that like our job as projectors is to make ourselves visible. It's to kind of share ourselves with the world in like a broad way. For me, it's been through podcasts or on Instagram or newsletters and let the right people kind of recognize and resonate with me and then come to me. And I think part of it is like projector energy is like a little bit intense. Like if people don't want to be seen by you, they're like, whoa, you know? So I see the invitation more than anything else as a tool to protect your energy and basically just let you know like who's ready for you. Because projectors, Mm. like so much of our gift is like actually penetrating deeply into people and making them feel incredibly seen and known and offering them perspectives that can really transform them. But it requires that they're ready for them and that they're asking for them. Right. So your advice for projectors who are, who, you know, want to start a business or want yes. to do things that like, like is just to put yourself out there and let yourself be seen. hundred percent. Like start a business, you know, it's, and yeah, I would sometimes just, like, you feel like they're a little limiting, right? When people totally. want to create their own life and do things. So yeah, yeah. like let's yeah explain how, how does it work? Totally. And I just like always try to remind people like, 
you know, human design is not meant to be a thing that feels constricting or confining. It's really meant to be a thing that feels like empowering and expansive. So if you're ever like, I sit with set people in sessions and they're like, well, I haven't done this because I'm a generator or a projector. I'm like, no, go do it. Like, just like, see what happens. Like, try it out. Um, I think as a projector, like no strategy is passive. Like if we're thinking about you waiting to respond, like you're not designed to sit at home. You're meant to be like busy doing the things that you love and just see what shows up in your world, you know, because that makes you magnetic. As a projector, like people cannot invite me unless they see me. And so my job is to one, really recognize myself and my own value and then let the world know that I exist. And that has been so much more successful for me than ever kind of like pitching specific businesses or things like that or clients. And so definitely let the world know. And, you know, that even could just be letting your community know. It could be like so much more intimate than like an online space, but it's often going to be like kind of more like you just showing up authentically and broadly is probably going to be the most magnetizing. Okay. And like, and I've tried pitching people in the past and it's just so exhausting. And it's like, sometimes it works, but I just like, it will like take me a day to recover. You know what I mean? I just know that it's not very sustainable for me. Um, and okay. Then we've got manifestors. These are kind of like our disruptors, our innovators, people that are really good at like initiating and getting things started. Not here to do all the doing, often here to like get a thing off the ground and then kind of like move on to the next thing. Their energy can be very spurty. So they might have creative bursts where they can make a lot happen and then kind of need to pull back and rest, whether it's for a couple of days or a couple of weeks. Um, they're really disruptive, innovative forces. Like they're really here to disrupt any environment they're part of. So it's really kind of trusting that they're here to be the first and to like do something new. And their strategy is about initiating. So when they feel that urge, just going to make it happen. Um, and also about just keeping people in the loop and kind of letting people know what they're going to do before they do it. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then we've got, um, oh, go ahead. we got one um, more time, I mean, but you go ahead. <laughs> I think you should expand on that a little bit, but when yes. you say that it, cause I, my boyfriend and brother are both manifestors and oh. I like, I feel like I know that type really well because their energy is not consistent. Sometimes yes. they're, yeah, <laughs> but they're very like, I mean, at least from my experience, they're very intelligent and they have yes. like really great things to say and really great input. They can yes. lead up. They're like CEO energy, but yes. not the doer. <laughs> they delegate and they don't do any, like they don't do the work. Yeah. Well, they're good at, they're good at getting it off the ground. Yeah, you know, I yeah. always say like an ideal, like when I work with so many manifestors as clients and like when they lead, it's very much like, let me just inform people of like what needs to happen. And then I'm going to like go away. Like, I don't want to micromanage them. Like, I don't want to keep an eye on them. Like, you know, and, and you're right. They're really strong. Like I would say if I was to like guess people's types, I feel like I, I can feel a manifestor more than I can any other type. Like there's just like an intensity, this like kind of very impactful yeah. energy. Like they walk in and you just feel them. Um, yeah. I'm curious for you because you're dating a manifestor. You said your boyfriend's a manifestor yeah. and your brother. And yeah. <laughs> so one of the biggest lessons for manifestors, which is a really often hard one for them is if they just like go off and do things and don't let people know, people can be quite resistant. But if they just like give people a heads up, like, Hey, I'm coming home late. Or I've like decided to go on this trip or like whatever, it like puts people so much more at ease, but it's often very unnatural for them to keep people in the loop. So it can like require a lot of effort to be like, Oh, I need to let people know what I want to do. Have you noticed that dynamic at all with the two of them in terms of the difference of like, if they keep you informed or not? Yeah. 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 Because their decisions are so sporadic and if they don't tell people what they're doing, it's like, it came out of nowhere totally. and you're like, well, you should have told me. You know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. People start like doubting them. And it's just like, and that's why I always remind manifestors. I'm just like, when you let people know that they, they just feel like they're on your team, you know, right, it's not right. about justifying yourself or explaining yourself. It's just like giving people a heads up. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I would also say is that manifestors tend to really value freedom. Mm -hmm. And so really just like giving them so much space to kind of be in their own flow and do their own thing and not like disrupt them. And also like not pestering them with questions. They can be mm -hmm. like a little bit annoyed if just like they're being yeah. pestered with questions all the time. Um, okay. Then we've got last one reflectors. So this is the rarest type and these people are kind of our collective mirrors, people that are deeply sensitive to their physical space, and they're always kind of taking in and magnifying the energy that they're around. And so you get a really good sense of how a team is doing or a company based on how the reflector is showing up. And so in the same way I mentioned to you, I think reflectors are meant to be such ruthless curators of the people and places they're spending time kind of with and in because they take so much of that energy in. So we talked about the centers piece, reflectors have every single center white and open. So they're taking an energy from so many different places. And so their magic is they're very naturally fluid. Like they will have days where they feel like a generator, like a manifesting generator, like a manifester. And so their job is not to put themselves into one box or be just one thing, but to honor whatever feels like them that day. 
And the last piece that I would share is that, you know, as reflectors, we often call them evaluators just because they see and sense things that so many people miss. And so it's really nice for them to kind of be in physical spaces where their perspective feels really kind of treasured and recognized and invited in. Yeah. Um, I mean, from the people that you've met that are reflectors, like, I mean, do they, because it sounds like they're super sensitive and they have to take things really slow and be very careful. Like, what are the, I guess, what are the typical roles in society, jobs or like, like what are they doing? Yeah, <laughs> That's totally. Just them. And, and, you know, they are super sensitive and they're also pretty resilient, you know? And mm-hmm. so it is kind of this interesting balance of just like making sure they're being really ruthless about the people they're around and also taking sufficient time alone. Um, you know, I always say like the ideal role for a reflector, and again, people can have so many different roles, but are is like a CEO whisperer. It's like mm-hmm. in a position where they're kind of like moving around, sampling and observing so much, and then kind of reporting back all the things that they see. I've worked oh. with a lot of reflectors that are like directors of people, directors of HR, like mm-hmm. positions where they're kind of really like reflecting back and supporting people. Um, but it's also really nice for them to be in spaces where they're not kind of like with the same person or the same team all day, every day, but where they feel like a little bit more able to kind of move their energy around and kind of sample different environments and different spaces. Oh, that's cool. So they're like a sponge, like let them float around and they will like totally. understand it all understand it all, like report back everything that's not working and how things can be made better. So it's, that's why it's so nice. Like I love working with teams for this reason, because when you really know what people's designs are, you like really have a whole new perspective on how to leverage them. You know, it's like, cause you could perhaps expect a reflector to be a generator and you're like, why can't you consistently show up all the time? But like, they just have a different gift. And so really like knowing how to at- leverage it. And I know whenever I have a reflector on my team or around me, I'm asking them questions all the time. I'm like, but what do you th- see about this? And what do you think about this? Because they just see so much. Oh, that's a good, I should get to know more people's human design charts because I, I don't know any reflectors right now, but I, yeah, I, I want to find out if I do. Totally. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I of course know like everyone's charts now, but it is like, it really shapes the way that I, like I have a manifestor sister, a manifestor mom. Like I just like, it, it shapes the way that I engage with my husband, with my friends, with my teammates, with my, you know, clients. It really just like helps us know how to really honor people for where they are and not expect them to be like us. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Okay. So j- a different question. What are some main misconceptions of human design? Like, are there any myths that you want to bust? Yeah, I just did a post on myths. Um, oh, you did? Yeah. Um, so many. Um, I would just say like in a more general term, you know, a general thing is like, I'm not really a dogmatist when it comes to human design. Like I think human design is a tool. It's not a belief system. I think we should use it if it feels useful and resonant and not if it doesn't. But I think that like any, anyone that says like, you cannot do this because you're this type is like such a myth. Like human Mm -hmm. design doesn't let us know what we can or can't do. It lets us know how we can do it best. You know, it's like, you know, there are so many myths of like, you can't do this because you're a projector. You can't lead because you're this type. And it's just like, no, it's just, you're all going to do it differently. Um, I think that's a big one. I think kind of some myths specific to type, you know, I think there's sometimes some myths around generators, like you are meant to like build other people's dreams. And I think for them, like they can build their own thing a hundred percent. You know, what matters is they're lit up and satisfied by like what they're doing. Um, I think there are myths around manifesting generators around like being flaky, you know, because they're not like they're, they're moving their energy around, but like they thrive when they have their energy in multiple things, you know? Mm-hmm. And so just knowing that's actually where their gift comes. Um yeah. There are myths for projectors around like not having energy and like it's, we have energy as projectors. It just ebbs and flows, you know? So I would just like remind people again, as you said at the, a little bit ago that like, this is very much meant to be an empowering system. So if any part of it Mm -hmm. feels disempowering or like not useful, I would let it go. I think my whole, what'd you say? Perspective. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, it's just like, this is exactly what it's meant to do is like help us not limit us. And I think that like my whole lens is very much like to deliver the information in the most empowering way. And also to remind people that it's just a tool. And I have, have experience because I worked with so many skeptics and teams where I also have to remind people that like, what matters less is, is it true? And what matters is like, is it useful? You know? Right. And I think that like, that's always been my focus. And it definitely wasn't at the beginning. I was definitely more dogmatic at the beginning, but like, as I worked with more and more people, I just like, I think that that's how these systems can be useful. Not when they're like applied in a really rigid way. Sure. Love it. Okay. So I want to kind of shift gears and ask you about your leadership coaching. Cause I know you do leadership coaching. So what does that look like? What's the process? Are you like, is it just based on human design? 
It is just based on human design. You know, yeah. I think that I, apologies for the dogs in the background. I think hey. that I've told you that I have these rescues <laughs> and they do their own thing. You know them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, um, before I discovered human design, I was working with a number of different startups and I loved it so much. And also like I observed a lot of dysfunction. It felt like people just like didn't quite know how to work together, you know, and, and I was just like kind of obsessed with like, why don't, why are people working together? Like they don't seem to understand each other. So when I discovered human design, my first desire was to bring it to teams to help people understand how to kind of better function as a unit. And so in terms of leadership coaching, it's often with CEOs and leaders and also with entire teams to help them know how to use human design to lead in a way that actually works for them. And also to know how to kind of support their team and really leverage the people that they have around them. And I think that like so often in teams, we get really caught up in all these like interpersonal dynamics because we just don't get each other, you know? And so I think human design is such an amazing lens to be like, how can we really understand like how to communicate with each person, how each person makes decisions, their strengths, like, you know, their flow, whether meetings might be good for them or not, just so that we can like really focus on what we're building and like have these dynamics like really handled. Um, so, so much of my like corporate work and leadership work is really around helping people use human design to kind of just find more flow in their leadership and in their businesses. Yeah. Wow. That sounds very powerful. Like to know everyone's human design and teach people how to work with each other. Cause I'm sure everyone can relate to not seeing eye to eye with the people that you have to work with. And so, so where do you start? And I mean, first of all, is there an ideal kind of structure in a team? Like, oh, there should only be one manifestor, mostly (laughs) generated. Like, do you have things like that or? It's in the same way that like I, I never try to be too rigid with this stuff. I think that like, you know, I worked with a team this past week that was like a manifester, a projector, and a generator, which I loved because they just like all brought really different things to the table and they found a lot of success because they weren't trying to be the same. So I think that like you're probably gonna have more generators and manifesting generators. They'll probably make up the majority of the team. And it's honestly nice to have a balance, you know, to have a projector, like manifestors and reflectors might sometimes like like corporate environments a little bit less, but they can totally thrive in them if they're in the right team. So I think it's more around like having a diversity of types and having a diversity of other aspects of the design. Because like, I remember I worked with a team that was all manifesting generators and it was like amazing. They had like so much powerful energy, but like they were all doing their own thing and like going in their own direction, you know? And it was just like, so I think it's really nice to be like, okay, where, what is the value that I offer? And like, what is the support that I need? You know, I'm a projector. My husband, who's also my business partner is a generator. And that's a really beautiful business combo. Everyone else we've hired is a projector. You know, Mm -hmm. I think that like, actually, no, we have one manifesting generator. Um, but it's really just nice to have a balance, but there are a lot of other cool pieces in human design of just like looking at all the skills people bring and seeing where the biggest gaps are and kind of how to hire and bring on people that really fill those areas. Mm -hmm. And it, it might be a little bit much, but is it, is it very detailed? Like, Oh, how to work with manifesting generators or generators, you you know, like different. It is. Yeah. I think that like, well, the question is like, whether it's really detailed and how to work with people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Or is it as simple as just knowing their, their decision-making and strategy? I mean, ideally, like we look at all the parts of their design, you know? Mm -hmm. So like all, you know, for example, like, can I use you as an example again? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if I was like, how to work with you, um, you know, there's a lot. One thing I would say, like really prioritize her excitement. Like when she's lit up, everyone benefits. I would suggest that people ask you really specific questions. So instead of communicating with you by being like, what do you think we should do about this? Like if they're like, what do you, what do you think? Do you like option A or option B? It might be a little bit easier for you to kind of access your truth and drop into like your gut immediately. Does that feel right for you? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I would say you make decisions in the moment based on your gut feeling. So as soon as it's a full bodied gut, yes, go ahead. If it's like anything but that, take your time. This is like not true for like, I've got to take my time. I've got to sleep on it. I'd say you're super independent. So like, of course, have meetings when you have to, but like having space to be in your own independent flow is probably going to feel really satisfying for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like meetings are draining to me. <laughs> totally. And this is yeah. like a thing called our definition, which is how we best process. And you're just like really independent. So to like kind of be in there like all the time is probably not going to feel good. Whereas some people really need that. Um, I would say you're like very much a tinker. Like you're going to just like try things and mess up and like learn from them and like keep fueling your growth. And so I think I would really encourage people to kind of support that trial and error process and never make you wrong for mistakes. Like you have to try things yourself to see what works and what doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. 
So things like that, you know, so it's, there are a lot of different parts. It does, of the design. Sound very, it does sound very detailed. It sounds like each person it is, is different. It is. And so it's, yeah. it's so specific. It's totally like, and that's the magic and challenge of human design. It's sometimes hard to talk about it generally because it's totally based on your specific design. Um, but yes, it is very specific. The type can give you a lot of information, but there's so much underneath it that can really help you know how best to kind of draw out the best in each person. Right. So when you're working with like a team doing this, like coaching or consulting, you literally have to break down yes. everyone, like the details of each person and they have to understand that about each other. Yes. And I also always remind people, like I've been doing a lot of team sessions recently where it's like, I'm like going to share a lot and like just take two or three pieces. You know what I mean? Like people can always go back and listen for more and it's nice to kind of create these little cheat sheets. But I think it really is just like, it's a really good exercise and reminding you that like the people around you probably operate really differently than you. And so instead of expecting them to like operate like you or make decisions as quickly as you or be as independent as you, it's like really taking the time to be like, but how do they work and how can I best support them? Yeah. Wow. Um, okay. I mean, another general question I have on here, it might be difficult for you to answer because everyone is different, but yeah. according to human design, like what is your recommendation for people when they feel out of balance? Like where should they look? Totally. Um, so I think that, well, the piece I would actually share is I'm going to just tell you the kind of signal that can reveal when you're off track for each type. Mm-hmm. So for example, for generators and manifesting generators to feel off track is often when you feel really frustrated. So, and that's just kind of like a resentment, a dissatisfaction. Maybe you're trying to like force things and it's not happening. So like when frustration starts to show up in a consistent and ongoing way, it's basically a time for you to check in and be like, am I trusting my gut? Am I waiting for things to come to me? Am I actually lit up by this thing? So it's kind of like the signal that like something needs to change. Before I talk about the others, you feel that frustration piece for you? Have you noticed that within your own life? No, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I, I will feel frustrated often. It, it, it comes and goes in, in different areas. But yeah, I just, I think the awareness of that emotion, like, oh, yes. if I feel frustrated, that's a reminder that I'm yes. on track. It's yeah. good to know. Tot- and it's so simple. And it's not just like you're doing anything wrong. It's like, oh, like some, there needs to be like a course correct right now. Um, for projectors to be off track is to feel bitter. And that's often rooted in like not feeling recognized or appreciated. So I know when I feel bitter, I'm often like, I got to go or like, I need to have a conversation and like, see if I still feel invited here. Like the last job I had, like I would have these moments with my boss where I would start to feel really bitter. And often it was like, we had to have a conversation and I had to like really like reconnect to whether or not I felt recognized there. Um, And so, and then for manifestors to be off track is to feel angry. And that Mm. often is rooted in the sense of, uh, I thought that was your dog again. (laughs) No. <laughs> no. the anger is often in feeling kind of like disempowered or confined or controlled like unable to kind of be in their own flow and do their own thing um and then for reflectors to be off track is to feel disappointed which mm-hmm. is often kind of um around just like not being in the right space like really trying to move at a pace that doesn't work for them trying to be really consistent in a way that doesn't work for them so like you said like these are all like little simple signals like something is not working here let me just kind of pull my energy back and see how i can show up in a way that feels more aligned and by looking at other parts of our design we can often diagnose very quickly what we're doing that's not really working i I think it's helpful for you to share all those emotions because when i hear you describe the other ones like bitter or angry like i'm like oh i'm never really bitter or angry like i'm not that's not who i am but frustration that happens often (laughs) i know i know it's it's so interesting because i really notice it in my like my sister with the anger and my partner with the frustration (laughs) and i watch those things come up and i'm like wow that's so different you know it's like it really is and and it doesn't mean that you can't like i can't feel frustrated or whatever but like it is not my go-to you know, yeah. and like bitterness. So everyone has a go-to emotion yes. that is negative signal. Yes. Like a signal really that like something needs to shift. Yeah. And it's a signal that like something in like their core human design or their core being is not being honored. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So do you have any last words that you want to share with our audience who are interested in learning more about human design? Of course. So, um, if they, do I, do you want me to share opportunities to go deeper or just kind of last words? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So one thing Plus I would just last words and then opportunities. Okay, to go so my last yeah. my last words are that like whether or not you choose to dig deeper into human design, it's such a beautiful reminder that we are all wired to operate differently. And so I would just kind of challenge people to really reflect on like where are you expecting others to be like you? 
you know, and like, where can you give them a bit more like grace to like operate in that way that actually works for them, whether it's a kid or a partner or a parent or a colleague and human design is a beautiful tool to do that. But also just sometimes being like, oh, let's have a conversation and like, let me understand how you make decisions and how you operate. So those are my last words. Yeah. Love it. (laughs) And then how can people learn more if they want to learn more? Yes. If you want to go deeper, um, I would say the best place to start is something called your blueprint, which is a 55 plus page written guide to unique design. So it really kind of walks you through all the most essential pieces. It will be totally unique to you. No, do, no two blueprints are the same. Um, and like I said, my intention is always to kind of deliver the information in a really kind of empowering, practical and actionable, actionable way. We have a discount code, um, which is Lavender. Is that right? I remember you said something else. <laughs> oh shoot you get on you you're from the ig live right oh no that was that was another one for you the oh, discount code is, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, the yeah, discount yeah, yeah. Code, <laughs> code is lavender so um you can use that and that's at human design blueprint.com um and then i also offer sessions that can be found at aaron claire jones.com and, and intimate workshops and we have a really cool um, we have a new kind of subscription offering coming soon um, and then i share a lot on instagram both at aaron claire jones and human design blueprint Amazing. Thank you so much, Erin. I learned a lot more today about human design and I encourage everyone to look up human design because I think at the very least, it helps you become more aware of yourself, learn about yourself. And then the next step is you recognize like everybody else is different from you and then learn about the people around you, look up their chart and that it will just make everything make more sense in your life. 100%. It was such a pleasure to connect with you again. And I love you like just getting deeper and deeper into it. So it was so nice to connect with you. Thank you for having me. 